everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm glad to be here. Um, thanks for having me here. I really appreciate it. We had these talks canceled a year ago, and so I'm glad I could lift it out of my archives and finish it up for you. Uh, so my name is Adam Rosine, and uh, I'm at Inner Product. We're a small consulting company. We focus in functional programming and Scala. Uh, and I often, mostly, uh, work in the type level ecosystem. And so I find it to be super useful. And I kind of wanted to share where type level is now and how you can use it in, in your job. So um, some of this you may be familiar with because you use a lot of um, the libraries and things like that. But um, I'm trying to give a new perspective here because type level has grown over the last years and is doing great. So this is the title of the talk. And there's a bunch of words in it that I kind of want to highlight. Um, so no need for NIH. NIH is this not invented here. This is where you don't necessarily want to bring in code from outside. Um, like I can do it myself. And we do live in this, you know, this this riches of open source, but at the same time, a lot of the the wheels keep getting reinvented and all that. So maybe type level can help. Um, so leveraging, that's like, okay, well, I, I really want to, is this is it worth it for me as a developer, for my team, for my company to, to use this technology, to use this code? Um, if it costs too much, if it has too many unseen costs, that's not so good either. Um, so what are we talking about? We're talking about the type level stack, the type level ecosystem. And it's this huge collection of these composable libraries. And you know, by enterprise, I mean your job. Maybe your hobbies too, your 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 um, your passions. But like the biggest questions I face from folks are trying to get something done at work. So maybe maybe type level can be involved. Uh, so I was uh, researching this talk and like, okay, what's going on with type level? Uh, it's been, I don't know, eight years now, I think, that it's been around. And I was talking with Lars, Lars Hoople, and he said, oh, um, back in 2016 at the type level summit, uh, Dave, Dave Grinnell, he gave a talk um, called End to End and On the Level. And it was about the type level stack. And so I was like, oh no, like Dave, Dave is always sort of ahead of me in the world of functional programming. And he's like five years ahead of me on this. And so he already talked about it. But then I thought, okay, well, um, type level's grown. There's so many new projects that like Cat's Effect hadn't even existed yet since at, at that time. So, you know, type level stack, okay. And what is this type level stack? And, you know, dubious Dave is there, okay. So what, what's the state of, of these things now? Um, well, in terms of just like numbers, the, there are a lot of repositories. So like 66 packages or repositories here, some of them are archived. They're not all the, the type level ecosystem is on the type level uh, GitHub repository. There's associated projects, but it's really large. Um, and it just sort of has been growing organically. And, the, and then people like Chris Davenport, like themselves have made 30 or 3,000 new packages. That guy is amazing. Um, but I wanted to sort of dig at maybe not just the parts of type level, you know, cats and things like that, but why is it useful? Um, because I think it just has, there's some properties of it that, that um, are really great and don't don't drag you down as a developer. So I wanted to know why. Um, so this talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ecosystem itself. Like I want to highlight the real foundations of it, and then I'm going to try and um, make some claims about why I think it works. Like why is it valuable? Why does it um, not cause too many problems if you use it, you know, like you could take on some dependencies and they're just a nightmare. And I don't think type levels like that. And then give some uh, resources and advice um, and sort of pointers to uh, how you can adopt and integrate type level uh, into your into your work. So that's the big plan. Okay. So first, let's talk about type level, the whole ecosystem. 
everyone has these nice little hex badges. Um, so what do we want from this ecosystem? You know, I'm a developer and I'm trying to get my job done. So, uh, and you know what, in our line of work, there are some things that happen over and over again. You know, we want we want to do all these kinds of kinds of activities. We want to access, we want data access. So we want to talk to our databases and our message queues and Kafka, whatever, in the cloud. Uh, we want to send send data and read it from other places. Uh, you know, in these days, where a lot of folks are writing web services, so they're speaking HTTP. You got to do JSON. You're sending things over. Maybe you're streaming big things. You're decoding. You're encoding. We do that all the time. We want to have good tests. We want to um, have something help us model our domain. You know, we have the language of Scala itself. We can build algebraic data types. And we have, a, you know, we have all the goodness of Scala itself, but what else can we add on it? So we do things, how can we parse? How can we validate um, what we're reading or parsing, you know, that's, make sure it's valid? How do we put invariance into our system uh, with, with the types and take advantage of the type system? And then like, you know, just very, you know, quote, practical things. How do we do command line arguments, configuration, logging, all that stuff? This is what we want to do. This is sort of the, the capabilities that we want. And so when, when we're looking for solutions, libraries, frameworks, and so on, we want, we want them to say, hey, here you go. I do that. Um, but at the same time, for all those areas, and, and maybe other areas that I you know, forgot, um, we want to make sure that everything is, is safe. Like, am I, am I adding risk to my code base? I want these things to compose so that when I combine them together, there's no mysteries. There's like, I'm not creating more problems for myself when I mix these capabilities together. We want our side effects to be managed. We want to handle concurrency. All, we have all these big needs. And maybe, you know, like fancy stream processing. I'm streaming requests in and streaming responses out and, and they're acting at the same time. I want whatever these libraries and this ecosystem gives me, I, I, want, I don't want it to mess with me. I don't want it to mess with my job. I want it to be solid. So I think that type level fulfills those, you know, fulfills those capabilities and sort of gives a, a little bit of those guarantees. Um, and so today I'm gonna talk about like the real foundations what, that make that happen. Um, so I'm going to focus on these libraries. Um, so starting from the bottom, because you know stacks they grow up, you, you, they're like bricks. You know, you you, do, you rely on your foundation. So at the bottom we have cats, and 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 you know there's actually there's actually layers underneath cats, right? Cats is built on algebra and all these things and shapeless maybe I don't know. Th there are other layers. These are the, so I, I'm trying not to be I'm not trying to exclude other important dependencies. I'm just trying to highlight a particular set of, of key dependencies. So cats is at the bottom, built on top of cats, cats effect. And I'm gonna describe like, okay, th these are just names if you're not familiar with them, but I'm gonna describe, you know, as we go along, what they give you, what they do for you. Uh, so cats, cats effect, on top of that is FS2, that's the streaming library. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about sort of so th those are like real foundational stuff. They don't talk about any kind of application scenario necessarily. But then I, I wanted to highlight um, sort of a web usage and a data access usage. So HTTP for S, you can imagine, is for dealing with HTTP. The S, you know, for S is for Scala. And Doobie is a database library, database access library. So these are the ones I'm going to sort of talk about and use as examples of, OK, they provide some of these capabilities. But then when the upper layer depends on the lower layer, they fit really well. And I'm going to try and give you a sense of like why. Why is that true? Uh, so let's get into cats. Uh, yay, cats. Woo! Um, so what's the deal with cats? Um, you know, there, it, has so, it has so much. It's, it's like a functional programming toolbox. One of the most useful aspects of it is it defines a set of type classes. So 
a set of behaviors that says, this is what this behavior means. And it, and it gives them some laws that they need to uh, fulfill. Uh, these are the, 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 the type classes that I'm, I'm showing here, functor, applicative, monad, and traverse. Uh, these are so foundational to functional programming. You know, there's lots of blog posts, there's books. These, this is where you can, these are like the, the bread and butter skills. Um, and, and the signatures up there are pretty abstract. I, I, I use this F, you know, you can substitute F with like list or something, it doesn't matter, or option. Um, so they describe things that are common, some behavior. So the ability to map is what a functor is about. And they have fancy names. It's functional programming. You have to have fancy names. So functors describe how do you map over something. If I have a collection of A's and I transform A's to B's, then I have a collection of B's. And we do this, you know, in many different settings. Uh, the applicative says, well, what if I have multiple contexts? So I have um, a number of lists, a number of options, a number of futures, a number of IOs. I have more than one, and I want to transfer the eventual results of them into something else. So it's, it's like map, but over multiple contexts. And then we have our favorite monad. You can watch somebody's monad tutorial. But it's basically about, well, how do I take the output of something and produce a new effect? So if, if, uh, if, the case, if it was the case like of uh, future, like uh, F and uh, F was future, if I had a future that was producing an A, once I get that A result, I'm going to produce a new future of B, and I'm going to view that as a future of B, and so on. And you can use four comprehensions, and this is not intended to be like a functional programming uh, introduction course. But this is what CATS defines. And finally, our friend to Traverse. Traverse is like, the way I think about Traverse is um, I have a bunch of work that I want to do, a list of A's. Um, but for each element, each, each piece of work, I want to um, fire off some, something that, that figures out the, the result type. So that would be like a G of B. You know, if, if F was a list of A's and A is our work, each A turns into a future of results. But then in the end, I want to gather all those results together into one list. So that I have one future with, with a list inside collecting all my results. So we use these all the time in our, in our, in our programming. The, this is how we sequence our, our operations. We're computing things, we're mapping, we're flat mapping, maybe we're traversing over some sort of collection type. Um, CATS lets us sort of say what that means. Um, so here's a little cheat sheet. Um, if you follow this cheat sheet, you'll be able to do functional programming like 95% of the time. So this is what you do. You have a problem. You're trying to figure out, how do I write the code to do whatever it is I'm trying to do? And so the first question you ask yourself is, can I use map? And if, you, if it is map, then you're done. Well, OK, what if it's not map? You say, is it a map n? Is it the applicative? Do I have multiple things that I'm combining? Well, if it's not map n, if it's not map, if it's not map n, is it flat map? OK, if it's not any of those, guess what? It's traverse. So that's the joke. But it's really true. Ask anybody. Ask your favorite expert. It's Traverse. And you can even go to this cool website that uh, Imperial Pix created. You can type in your question, and you press a button, and it says, it, it tells you what the answer is. And pretty sure you want Traverse. So check that out. So there's a lot more in CATS. Uh, there are more type classes talking about air handling and parallel somethings. Uh, it also provides a bunch of really helpful data types. So there's the chain, which is like a list. There's IORs that let you distinguish errors versus warnings. Uh, there's these non-empty collections, like lists. Sometimes lists can be empty, and you, you forget about that. But what if you want something not empty? Well, here's a non-empty list, and so on. Super useful. Uh, I'm guessing many folks have, have seen this. But if it's new, it's really useful. So think of it as just this you know, utility belt or some metaphor like that. OK, so that's at the bottom, the, the, the foundation, one of the foundations of type level. So next up, I built on top of cats is, is cats effect. Um, so there we go. 
So what is cat's effect about? Um, well, again, it has a set of type classes and a set of data types that it provides. So cat's effect is about, well, how do I deal with side effects? How do I deal with parallelism and concurrency, forking off you know, tasks in the background? How do I safely um, acquire and release resources? Um, it's really powerful and really well put together. And the, the Cats FX3 just came out. So um, it's everyone putting a huge amount of effort and it's, it's, it's doing really great. Um, so it, it, it's essentially about describing how more advanced side effecting, concurrent, parallel, all these things uh, can work together and what guarantees they have. Uh, and what's really great is it provides a bunch of data types that let you live in that world of concurrency, uh, of side effects, of things communicating at the same time. We have the IO type, which describes sort of any side effect. We have resources, we have fibers. Uh, there's concurrent data structures like refs for atom atomically updating your state, uh, semaphores, cues, all these good things. If you need these kinds of data structures, Cat's Effects has it. Again, like cats, these are very low level things. They don't tell you about your domain. They don't um, say you're working in the environment of, of, a, of a web service. These are just sort of the, the nuts and bolts and primitives that you would use for other systems. Uh, so one example of like, how would I use this? Well, you know, in, this, in the simple example, we might have um, two different effects here. So we're gonna print hello to the console and we're gonna print uh, world to the console. What if I wanted to do both? Well, we have cat's effect is built on cats. So we can tuple these effects together and that produces just a single effect that performs both of them. So, so if I have, uh, and kind of not only, you know, th this might seem a little trivial, but the kind of the, the main point that I'm trying to highlight is that if you understand um, cats and cats provides this uh, tupled method, um, then when you encounter this IO in cats effect, you can say, oh, well, I know that IO is, a, is an applicative. And, and if I know that IO is an applicative, I can tuple things together and then I can get the effects of both. So the knowledge of from cats of applicatives, and you know, it's not necessarily clear how you would, would discover that IO is an applicative, but once you know that, you can say, ah, well, I can use all the applicative goodness from cats to deal with these effects now. Whereas previously I was dealing with lists and options and things like that. Now I can uh, tuple things together with cats, be, with cats effect, because I understand cats. And then I can take advantage of cats effect. Cat's effect knows about parallelism and concurrency. So instead of using tupled, I can use par tupled and that will fire off these effects in parallel. And so I'll get hello world or maybe world hello if, you know, once it gets uh, serialized out. So, so not only is Cat's effect providing new capabilities, sort of parallelism, but it's building on top of the abstractions below it. And I, uh, so this is, the, this is the pattern that I'm gonna try and emphasize. If you know the layers below, it helps you understand the layers above that are giving you new functionality. So, okay, let's move up the stack a little bit more. Uh, so FS2, FS2 is about streams. What, well, what is that? Um, well, it's built on top of Cat's Effect. And so, and cat's effect is built on top of cats, and FS2 uses cats also. So streaming, what's streaming about? Well, streaming is sort of like, okay, well, I'm going to um, describe, instead of sort of looping explicitly and, and pushing data into some, some sort of uh, like a push style iteration, what if instead I could describe what to do with elements as I pull them off, off of this stream thing? Um, so, so that involves uh, effects and side effects. It involves concurrency. What if I wanna be streaming in from multiple sources at the same time and writing them out somewhere on an, uh, you know, 
in another thread or some sort of logical notion like that? Um, what if my what if what I'm streaming sort of has some notion of state and it needs to be closed properly? All those things are built together from cats and cats effect into FS2. So the, the, the lower layers are in actually informing the upper layers. And the upper layers, FS2 in this case, is adding all these new capabilities using the primitives of the layer below. You know, this is this is what we want. We want to be able to reuse our software. So I, I don't think I have any concrete examples, but I mainly wanted to highlight like everything in the lower layers again uh, informs the upper layer, and the upper layer gives you these new capabilities. So even so, we had cats, cats effect, uh, FS two. Let's let's get into a little bit more of a domain. So so HTTP for S. I want to write HTTP servers and HTTP clients. Let's use HTTP for S to do that. Um, so it describes itself, you know, as a typeful functional streaming HTTP for Scala. Ah, streaming. Okay, streaming. I wonder if FS two is involved. Well, yes, it is. So you know, if you imagine, you know, if you think about what a um, a web server or an HTTP server is, it handles multiple requests at the same time. Um, and so you could think about, well, okay, well, if I know how to handle one request and return some response, then you could consider a server to be something that takes a stream of requests and produces a stream of responses. And that's sort of, uh, you know, to a fair approximation of how HTTP for S works. You know, you tell it how to do a route, and you can combine routes together, and then you convert that into this, you know, the HTTP for S stream, you know, links it all together with streams, which of themselves are built with effects and concurrency and resources, which is in its which is built out of the sequencing and the type classes of cats and all these things. So it all fits together. Uh, and finally, sort of as a, as a, as in a parallel, or, or you know, at, at the same level of as as HTTP for S in the in the data access realm, maybe maybe uh, maybe in your HTTP for S code, you need to talk to a database. Well, that makes sense. Um, so Doobie, what is what is Doobie about? Well, it sort of wraps JDBC in into this world of FS two, Cats Effect, Cats. And you know, JDBC is like this super old library, um, and it's not—it's not, it's not in, written in a functional style. It's—it's uh, it's crazy, and so you know, it, Rob wrapped it up in this nice interface, so we don't have to deal with it. You know, all the all the whatever it does. <laughs> uh, and again, like streaming, what 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 might streaming mean in this case? Well, you know, databases you can. Um, if you're you're inserting lots of things, you would be streaming, uh, you know, rows into the database, and you might be streaming rows out of the database. Uh, and Doobie lets you treat your database, you know, in in that way as as sort of this source of streaming information or a sink of store of of uh, information. And again, it's built on the same things. So if you uh, and then to use Doobie. Uh, we see the same concepts and you know, like literal interfaces being used over and over again. We see the stream type from S FS2. We see um, different combinators, you know, from the cats library being in, put into use. Uh, so let me show you an example. Um, these are not like mind blowing examples. This is like I, I really want to emphasize like the like bread and butter in the sense of like very everyday examples, like boring examples. Um, so like, again, we have Doobie, and Doobie introduces new types. So FS2 introduces like the stream type, Cats Effect introduces the IO type, uh, and the, 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 the upper layers use the lower layer. So in Doobie, there's this new type called a connection IO. It represents something like a query. You know, if you give it a connection, it's going to give you an int in this example. If you give it a connection, it's going to produce a double. So if I had these two query-like objects, um, what if I wanted to get both an int and a double? Do I have to write a new query to get, 
you know, to get to get those two things? Well, no, I can I can combine them together. I can, you know, compose them. And so because I know that connection IO is a monad, you know, I can look at its interface. I can ask the compiler, hey, is this thing a monad? And it says yes. Uh, that means, okay, well, I know how to sequence these um, these queries together. I know how to say, well, do this one and then do that one. And now, instead of having two connection IOs, I have one connection IO. So in order to understand connection IO, I don't really need, it doesn't have its own custom, um, you know, ways of combining queries. I just have to remember about like flat map or a for comprehension. I don't have to learn a new API. And then maybe like, okay, well, maybe I don't even need a for comprehension. There's these, these queries are not really dependent upon each other. So I could just use the applicative tupled, you know, which is equivalent to a map N. Does, does Doobie have to uh, provide these special ways of, of composing? No, we've com composition is already defined in cats. So again, to understand Doobie, I don't have to understand this whole new world. It's like, ooh, I'm not in this crazy Doobie world. No, Doobie's like this, relatively thin layer and I learn the, the doobie concepts and I get to reuse all the other concepts that I've already learned. So that's the idea. Hopefully I've hit you over the hammer with, with that idea. Over the head with the hammer. Okay. So that's like my intro and a little bit of a tour of the ecosystem. Now now I kind of want to step back a little bit and and I found that working with these libraries, these libraries are interconnected. You know, each layer uses the one above it, and there's layers to the side also. Um, I find that they work. It works really well. I feel like as a developer, I'm I'm like efficient. I'm not. There's not too much friction, and I wanted to understand why. Um, so, so this quote kind of helped me sort of put words to the idea that I was thinking about that and, and, and wanted to communicate. So, um, so there's a famous quote that goes, you know, a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that works. So we get something complex from, we can only get something that's complex from something simple, simple. If we just try and create a complex thing out of the box, it's not going to work. You have to start over. Uh, so that's that's the that's it's known as uh, Gall's law from John, John Gall, and this kind of reminded this made me think about software because you know we, it applies to software because you know we're building systems all the time and our, even you know our code base is our systems. We have multiple components, we have libraries, they have dependencies, they're interacting with each other. Um, so you might you might take that quote at you know it's a law so I better listen to it but like why is that true why can't I just design a complex system why does it never work you know this is an admonition this is a warning it doesn't really tell you why so so in the context of software you know is this true and and why why is it true so then there's this joke. So, okay, I, there's this general law. How can we bring it to software? This is joke. Okay, well, what's a framework? Well, a framework is just a, a product with the business logic removed, but all the assumptions left in. And, and so um, this is meant to highlight, you know, it's it's funny because it's true. And, and you're like, why is it true? It, so all the assumptions left in, there's like this extra extra garbage that you have to deal with. You know, you're using a framework, and the idea of the framework is that you plug in your code, and the framework does all this stuff for you. But the framework has all these assumptions. Well, I'm not going to call your code the way you think it is, or I'm only going to call the code when I want to. Like, the, the, the protocol between those two parts is very undefined, or it, it tends to be undefined or, or very picky. Um, so... We want to avoid that, you know. Like, if I'm going to use, some, you know, a framework as a dependency. If I want to, if I'm going to use a dependency, I don't want. I want to minimize the amount of um, burden that it places upon me. Uh, so that that's getting more towards okay. That to me that says there there must be something 
how do we not do that? that that's sort of where I'm going. Uh, and then qu quite a number of years ago, Tim Parrott wrote this great article um, called Frameworks Are Fundamentally Broken, sort of about the same point. And, and he really, um, I think he laid out the reasons why um, very well. And so I kind of highlighted the the parts that that I think um, are the are, are the are the, the the kernel of it. So um, frameworks don't compose together. Like when you add a framework to your project, and when you have more than one framework, they don't interact. They get deeply connected and spaghettified, and and they inter they start interacting with each other. Um, and the problem for at least the humans involved, you know, that's us, this, these expensive resources. Um, because these frameworks are like this, that they're not composable in some way, it, it requires our users to learn all these things, um, how to do everything in, a, in the special way that the framework teaches us. There's no like reusability there. You have to live in the world of the framework, otherwise you're screwed. And you may not even know you're screwed. Right, all this weird stuff can happen because you didn't know the secret recipe, and you got to go to some blog post that says what the secret recipe is. I hate that. Uh, and then when we use it, you know, like we don't know why we have to do these things. This is this is the second point. We don't truly understand it. Um, it doesn't follow any sort of laws or heuristics that we can figure out. You know, it's just sort of like I hope it works. Woo! So I think this is this. This exemplifies the risks and the dangers of, of things that don't compose, whatever that means, you know, composition being this good functional programming thing. If, if they don't compose, there's these risks. We do not want this. Um, so then, okay, well, maybe libraries in some sense are, are better than frameworks. Um, can we remove the assumptions? If frameworks have all these assumptions baked in, how do we get rid of them? Because if there are less assumptions, then there's less of a burden, a less of a cost for the developers and for the organization, for the maintenance. I don't have to keep all these things in my head. I don't have to teach my staff, my coworkers, myself, all these ar arbitrary things. So, or maybe even no assumptions. How could we do that? How could we have a library that doesn't make any assumptions? I don't want it to place any burden on me at all. That would be super. That would be super. Um, and there's these, you know, the the. The questions we need to ask ourselves when we're adding a new dependency, a new library, how much effort is there going to be? What if I add it, do I have to change any code? If I start using it, does it gonna is it gonna leak everywhere in my in my program? Or does it work together with my other dependencies? Maybe it's just gonna cause all this, I don't know, it's just gonna cause all this trouble. These are the questions we have to ask. And so what we really don't want is if we add a new library, you know, that has some cost, but then it creates all these, you know, recursive costs, you know, multiplicative problems, exponential problems. Uh, this is what we want to avoid. So I thought that for some reason, the type level ecosystem avoids this problem. Um, so that's, that's really my claim. And, and it's kind of the way I've decided to to declare it was um, the cost of type level libraries. I claim is is just an additive cost. You know, it does. We don't want our costs. If I add one library, it's going to you know cost n somethings. I don't want it to cost n squared somethings. You know, if if I add a library and I have to change fifty percent of my code base in a non trivial way. I don't want to do that. So this is my assertion. Why is it true? Well, I think it's because of the composability, the you know fancy words like parametricity, um, closure, uh, the real, the functional programming, the statically typed functional programming, higher kind of types, the use of type classes. They bring these good properties that make the costs um, bounded. I I. I think um, closure. Just as as an aside, closure means like I'm not m multiplying the things you need to know. If you add a Lego with a Lego, you get a Lego. You don't get something else. 
So like in object-oriented um, code bases and designs, one of the problems is that the nouns just keep multiplying. You got this and that and this and that and this and that. And you just have to know so many different concepts and nouns. What I like about functional programming is that sort of it's, it's a bit more closed. You have a monoid and it says, well, when you add a Lego and a Lego, you get a Lego. There's no new concept. You're still, you're still within the world of Lego. And our libraries tend to reflect this. Um, so maybe in the world of type level and you know, in functional programming in general, like I don't want to say that this is exclusive. I think functional programming is great and is, it's exemplified by type level that we learn these concepts once and we can apply them everywhere. Hashtag, I don't know. So uh, to finish up, we talked about, you know, a little bit about the, the major components of type level, uh, why I think it's why I think it's valuable and, and why it works. Um, how can you, you know, adopt it, integrate it, take your code base to the next level, take advantage of more libraries, more techniques. Uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of information uh, and sort of resources about these things because I didn't think they were collected in, in many places, first of all. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of educational material. You can go to the website. There's all the project sites. There's lots of blog posts. If you type type level and then something, results will appear. There are books now. I wrote one. Gabriel wrote one. Noel and Dave wrote them. There's lots of books out there. You can get training from companies. You can get mentoring. There's a lot of possibilities here. So you are not alone. Uh, you can just ask folks. Uh, here's some books. There's Scala with Cats, Essential Effects, Practical FP and Scala. We're starting, you know, in the past they were blog posts. Well, in the past past, you know, you just had to talk to somebody in IRC or something. And then there were blog posts. And now there are books, so we're, we're on a nice evolution here. And there's going to be more in the future. We have our community. It's growing. Uh, we re recently added, uh, thanks to Chris Davenport and a bunch of other folks, like we have a Discord server now. Uh, it's a little bit better for what we want to do um, than Gitter was. We have our Gitter, GitHub repos and discussion boards. We have meetups. We have conferences. We have people streaming. This is amazing. Uh, people will just hack on, you know, Daniel maybe will hack on uh, on uh, Cat's Effect or something. It's cool. People are out there doing stuff. You can you can chat with them. People want to help you. They're very nice. I like that. And there's, uh, you know, there's more, there's ways to get support. You can ask the community. Go on to the chat channel and say, hey, I have a problem, and people will help you. It's It's great. I do that all the time. It's more interesting than some of the work I have. So I'm like, oh, maybe I can answer a question. Woo! You can hire people. People know about these libraries. They can help you integrate. They can help you solve problems. Uh, and there's a lot of tooling now. We're starting to get more and more tooling. Like we're building on uh, Scala format and metals and all these things. Um, there's migration scripts. And that reminds me. Uh, oh, well, you know, so in case this is a new, um, the type level stack is new to you. Uh, I would say sort of the one of the gateways in is uh, if you're considering if you're having sort of issues dealing with futures, um, you have some concurrency going on. It's hard to manage the features. It's a little bit fragile code. This is a very common sort of uh, way to to get started into something like uh, the effect types of of I/O and task and things. So. This is sort of this is one of the the funnels in if you if you uh, if you have a problem at work and you might consider type level this would be a good scenario to sort of explore. Um, divide and conquer that is the solution. This is what you do for that problem. There you go. Now you know. Um, so did you know about Scala Steward? In case you didn't, this thing is amazing. It's like a robot that sends you pull requests. So you don't have to, it's not your job anymore to like update dependencies. It'll give you the pull request. It's amazing. And if you look at the stats, look at how many, look, look how many PRs. Like no human can do that. This thing is great. So the automation has helped so many people like, oh, I don't, that's not my job anymore. Oh, it's so great. Okay. 
So that's really all I have for today. I wanted to talk about type level, why it's good, what makes it good. Um, and really the message is, I know this. So it's a type, it's, it's a type level type class based system. I know this. The, you come across a library, like maybe you're not, you don't know how to use uh, Doobie, but you say, okay, it's in type level, Doobie. It's got to be, it's, it's type level. It's got to be based on FS2 and cat's effect and cats. There's going to be, I can map over things. I can flat map. I can, uh, you know, run things in the background. I can par map them. I got this. We know what to do. And then you just learn a little bit about what the dubiness of it. So that's really the strategy. Um, we have the common pattern of composable, closed, you know, side effect, side effect free um, abstractions. Everything is built this way. Uh, if we do have side effects, throw a cat's effect at it. Done. Problem solved more or less. And what's nice is all this code, you know, cats, cats effect, FS2, all the libraries built on top of them, they have nothing to do with your domain. You can work, you can put your domain code over there, cats is living and all the libraries are living over there and you write some glue code. You don't have to change your domain too much to interoperate. They're very loosely coupled. This is very nice. It's really powerful. So that's what I have. Uh, here's just the, the biggest links. Um, you know, you can go to the website, Discord server, there's books, go ask people. I'm happy to recommend um, a lot of different libraries, other resources, I, I wanna help people out. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me at my company, Inner Product, we'll help you out. And that's all I have, thanks very much. Hey, Adam, thanks so much for your talk. My Sorry. pleasure. <laughs> well, we do have a couple of questions that uh, we'd like to ask you live. And let's see our first. How would you compare FS2 to ACA streams? Uh, FS2 to ACA streams, okay. Um, well, I think they're they're related, but they kind of but they're not they're not like exact synonyms for each other. So they don't necessarily do the same thing. Um, Aka streams is kind of yeah, it, it to me it, it sort of they're both about flowing you know data through some sort of pipeline, um, and, and I think Aka streams emphasizes more of like building kind of these arbitrary topologies. Um, and, 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 you know, you don't have to use it that way, but I, I think it sort of emphasizes it. Um, and it whereas FS2, it encourages you to think in terms of very much more linear um, sequences and, and you handle, you, you can sort of simulate more of a graph by, uh, by having sort of concurrently communicating streams rather than sort of plugging them in, in forking and joining and things like that. Like you can do it. Um, I feel a little underqualified, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can um, give any more insight. Um, I, think, I think also the processing model is a little bit different. So I mean, the FS2 is definitely a poll-based model. So you, you sort of describe, well, whoever, once I get an element, I do something with it. Whereas uh, Aka streams is, I think, a lot more flexible. There's pushing, there's pulling, there's back pressure. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more flexibility in that regard. Um, and probably the other thing I would I would emphasize is just the in FS2, you know, you're in the world of of cat's effect, um, you know, effect management. So. Uh, everything is referentially transparent uh, and sort of pushes you towards, towards
towards that style, whereas uh, the future-based uh, nature of of uh, of Aka streams, I don't know if that's really a problem. Maybe people have a problem. Maybe I'm making up a problem. I don't know. I I I feel a little underqualified to answer too much, but so so th those are the two areas that I think are probably the difference in the, the sort of the topological aspect and the 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 push pull aspect. Right. Well, thank you. Our next question is, how can a lib be free of assumption? Is a Scala lib not at least assuming you are using Scala or maybe even some degree of FP? Um, well, it is kind of an ideal, right? Like, how can you use something and make no assumptions about it? Um, one of the, a more concrete example I think could help. So for example, like a list, the list is part of the standard library, but but a list can hold any type of information. You can have a list of integers. You can have a list of whatever your type is. List doesn't know about your types. So I kind of meant it in that sense. Um, you know, these are things with type parameters, like for example. Um, so a list is completely decoupled from whatever is inside of the list. And it still has functionality. You can say, how long is the list? It doesn't matter what's in it, it's just how many are, are there and so on. Um, so similarly, there are other abstractions that are uh, that work the same way. So um, if something is traversable, that means a particular thing in cats, but it doesn't, it doesn't care, like again, what the contents of those things are. Or in FS2, FS2 doesn't care what the elements that you're streaming are. It describes what you might want to do with those elements. Um, so that's kind of the sense in which I, I mean. And again, you can't always do that, but it's definitely when you can, it's very powerful because you really have no, um, no, you know, coupling other than the immediate interface. You don't have to know any secret knowledge. The list doesn't have to know about your type in order for the list to work with it. There's no dependencies. Right. It looks like we have one last question. Do you think internalizing cats and cats effect could help a simple Spark Scala data engineer get better? Oh, okay. Um, I'll have to guess a little bit on what you mean, but um, like there's the, in, I, I could take, I guess I could take internalization in two different ways. I could take it as, I could internalize the concepts in my mind and sort of keep them in mind when I'm programming in a different environment like Spark, which doesn't explicitly use these concepts necessarily. Um, or it, I could take it to mean, how could I perhaps literally embed the use of cats and cats effect within a Spark program? So, so at least for the first part, how, how could we trans, you know, keep these concepts in mind and apply them? I think that's totally um, something that would work. So um, by understanding the concepts um, like monads and traversables and you know, some maybe the concurrency things from cat's effect and how to delay side effects, just by understanding those structures, it can help you um, be able to reason about code in like a Spark, written with a Spark library, you know, in its style. Um, I hope. Um, I think it can inform you. You know, it's it's educational. It's like, ah, okay, I, I can. I'm imagining that when I'm uh, doing this aggregation in Spark, well, I since I know about monoids from cats, I imagine there's some sort of monoid going on. There's there's sort of like that. Like, aha, okay, I, I can get a little bit of structure there. But then, um, so I guess briefly, I'd say you can embed these things into Spark. Now, if you try and use concurrency, for example, from within Spark, you might be fighting the system itself because the idea of Spark is to take some of that concurrency off your hands and Spark manages it itself. But in terms of the other you know, non-concurrent structures, um, you can certainly use that code from within Spark to make your domain you know, more, um, more understandable, more type safe, you know, they use those static types, all that stuff can apply within the runtime of Spark also. 
Great. Well, that is our last question. Thank you so much, Adam, for joining us today. My pleasure. Wow.